Good morning, Park Center. I want to open up in a word of prayer first. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your, all your blessings. We ask that you um, bring us all here in worship, Lord, and to focus on the word this morning and to take out the stresses that we have on a daily basis. Lord, I pray. <laughs> that you would allow me to convey your word so that it would be honoring to you. Okay, so, Advent, the approach to an important arrival. So I remember watching The Little Drummer Boy as a kid and watching it with great anticipation. Year after year, I couldn't wait for him and the wise men to arrive in Bethlehem to see the new little baby Jesus. They were on this journey. The wise men knew that the Savior would be born. What joy that was for them to arrive and witness the little baby Jesus. They knew the Savior had arrived and that he would change our world forever. For hundreds of years, the church has anticipated the coming of Jesus during the season of Advent. The third week of waiting for his arrival invites us to receive his joy. I'm a little emotional. (laughs) This is my first time up giving a sermon, and I'm so blessed and honored. So Jesus arrived after a period of 400 years of silence, confusion, and longing for the Jewish people. Into this space, the angels announced to the shepherds, the good news of Jesus, who would bring great joy to all people. We have the joy in knowing that our Lord, who was prophesied to come hundreds of years before his arrival, that he would come, God in the living flesh, living among us, being the most valuable and pure sacrifice that would cleanse our flesh of our sins and offer us eternal life. Ah, eternal life. That could be a key factor in joy right there. So I want to open it up to everybody here. So what is joy? What's your definition of joy? Does it? Pure happiness? Okay. Michelle, how about you? Amen. So that's, that's joy right there. Anybody else? Angel? I like the word rejoice if I might, um, because he tells us to continually have this joy. It should be a, a state of mind that has nothing to do with amusement park mentality or fun or things going your way. Right. But rather it's knowing that no matter what comes in this life, the King of Kings not only lives within me by the person of his spirit, mm-hmm. he is the one that will escort me home. This this is a small hotel room compared to the great mansion. Amen. I am walking and living with Jesus Christ all the days of my life. Mm-hmm. That can bring joy, and that's much different Amen. Than, than happiness in our trials. Wow. Joy is spiritual with Jesus. Yes. I agree. Caitlin, what do you think? What's joy for you? Forgiveness. Forgiveness? These definitions are they're right on. These are very good. I was going to ask, how does happiness differ from joy? But really, nobody brought up something external, something about happiness. It was all about true joy, as far as I know the definition. So let's talk, let's talk about Webster's Dictionary and their definition. And Pastor Paul and I were going over this uh, last week. There's differences between Webster's Dictionary back in the day, Webster's 1828. They gave some true definitions of joy. 
But the new Webster's isn't really quite so accurate. So Webster's Dictionary defines joy as a condition or feeling of high pleasure or delight, happiness or glad gladness. Some other definitions include joy is an emotion so deep and so lasting. Joy is a source of cause of keen pleasure or delight. Joy is an expression or display of glad feelings or festive gaiety. Joy is a state of extreme happiness. So my analogy of that is similar to a tachometer in a, in a car. And we're just going to call that car a Shelby. All right? So... So you're idling there, 750 RPM, that's, that's probably you know, a low amount of happiness. You start pushing on the accelerator pedal and you bring that tack up, you're up around 2,000 RPMs, you're having a good time. Maybe you're at the mall, you know, you're about to do some shopping. And then you kick it in and you hit red line. That red line, psh, that's joy, as far as their Donut definition the goes. <laughs> Donuts in the parking lot. So that could bring a lot of happiness. I, I believe that joy is something that lasts. Happiness is something that is temporary. Joy brings with it a feeling of contentment and confidence, which can, which can take us through a storm in our life journey. And we know about those storms. Happiness is not present. We are in the midst of a storm, and it can vanish quite quickly. Joy comes from within us, it's an internal experience mm -hmm. where happiness is caused by external circumstances or experiences. So joy comes from within and lasts for a long time. Mm -hmm. Happiness is brought on or caused from external circumstances. So let me go back to my opening. Jesus is within us and through him he provides us eternal life. Eternal is a measurement of time, and that's a long time. In fact, eternity has no beginning and has no end. Knowing that by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and understanding all He's done for you will result in a life of joy. And when you live joyfully, you can put off a lot of the stress, decrease worry exponentially, improve relationships, increase friendships. Smile almost all the time. And another thing is it'll help you stop judging others. Be no need for that. Jesus is joy. Jesus is what provides us with joy. He is not temporary or external, so he's not happiness. Joy is a fruit that grows in, in us from knowing Jesus and then having a personal relationship with him. If you truly have faith that he is the Son of God, then live that every day. Be true to yourself for your faith. If you have faith that He is the Lord, then ask Him. Ask Him to be with you. Ask Him for wisdom. Ask Him for protection. Ask Him to be in your heart. And ask Him for guidance. Before going out the door in the morning, before you go out and head out into the world, stop and say a prayer and ask God, please, Lord, be with me. Anybody that I see today, anybody that I talk to today, Lord, allow your spirit to come through and let them see and hear you through me. Don't show them the flesh. Amen. The flesh is sin. Show him the spirit. So pray that before you leave. A few patients have asked me um, on occasion, why are you always smiling? And I'm not truly always smiling, but they, I've had patients actually ask me that. Why are you always smiling? Why are you so happy? And I tell them uh, 
I, I said, you're not seeing me. I say, I tell him that you're seeing God within me. You're seeing the Spirit of God in me coming out. And I've gotten some interesting responses to that. And when life gets really rough, ask him to take over your life and give it to God and have faith that he will, in fact, take on your needs and help you through those valleys. Ask him. If you have faith, then ask him. In James, we're going to look at James 1, 2 through 3. It should come up on the monitor. If not, open up your Bibles to James 1, verses 2 through 3. These are um, titled Trials and Temptations. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Psalm, we're going to go to Psalm 94, verse 19. When, I, when anxiety was great within me, Holy cow, when anxiety is great within me. Your consolations brought joy to my soul. That right there is what we're talking about with having God in your life and in your heart. A person who believes in God but doesn't really have a strong faith will usually put the burden on themselves to solve their own issues. A Christian who is teetering on belief or struggling with their faith may pray, but in the back of their mind, they might not believe that the prayer will be heard or acted upon. So they're kind of in a state of working through their faith. And we were all there. And some of us are probably still there. I don't really think so in this room. But as Christians, as you mature in your faith, you will find yourself doubting less and when you do doubt, oh, overcoming it quicker and not allowing it to hinder you. Be patient and faithful like the farmer who prayed for rain in the midst of a drought. All these farmers knew that there was a drought so that the one, the one who had faith in God that he would come through, he prayed to God and he went out to his field and he, and he planted those seeds, and the rain came. He was prepared. So let's be like the farmer. So that farmer had true faith and knew God would come through for him. If you have this kind of faith, God will come through for you, and you will live in joy being faithful to Him. A person who doubts God won't plant the seed, and a man who doubts God's existence will not have the joy that we know comes from God. In 1 Peter, or 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 8 through 9, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith and the salvation of your souls. Amen. Just so that you know, when Peter was writing this, he was delivering to a church in the midst of severe persecution. Christians being hung on, hung on crosses, being boiled alive, being fed to lions, being exiled from their families. During this time, that's what's happening with Christians, but they still found joy in their hearts. In 1 Thessalonians, uh, verse 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's what was going on during that time, that affliction, that torture. But even during that, they had joy in their hearts. 
because they knew what God had for, in store for them. The fruit of the Spirit are within us. In Galatians 5, through 23, we have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, patience, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control. And don't forget gentleness. Gentleness is in there too. On the opposite hand, the fruit of the flesh is sinful. They're external and can cause no joy. Happiness maybe, but not joy. So another question for everybody. Can other things here on earth bring us joy? Melissa, you're so quiet over there. Are there any other things that you think are here on earth that can bring us joy? No. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. I believe that a true friend, our family, our precious children can bring happiness and joy. They're with us for a long time, right? They can get to us internally, right? Drive us nuts sometimes, but truly give us joy. But imagine this. If you lose a husband, if you lose a wife, if you lose a parent, or if you lose a child, the enormous emptiness and depression that would that would leave you in imagine going through this without god in your life get in get yeah. out now imagine this with god in your life by all means we will still struggle through these situations and there would be a heavy burden on our hearts. But God's joy will help carry you through that. God's word, his love, his grace will give us all the joy in our souls that will get us through storms that no person could ever do or give us. We like to rely on people to help us out. And, and that's okay, but keep God number one. My ear's a little small. We all anticipate joy on the day when Jesus will return again. And his kingdom will bring in a time of un, unhindered relationship with God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In Romans 15, Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I have another verse, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set up before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what that's saying, as Jesus was being judged by people who didn't know him, beaten, whipped, and tortured, and led to Golgotha, Calvary as Christians know it, he was being led there, there was no happiness in Jesus at that point in time. He was being tortured the whole way up. Nevertheless, he was led with the cross on his back and in finding no happiness in this. But Jesus viewed our salvation as something so important that he found joy in going to the cross. 
because he knew that what he was doing was the will of the Father and that his will be done, which would lead us to our salvation. For us, there's the joy. There's the joy. He was on his way up to Golgotha. He was not happy. But boy, he had the joy in his heart because he knew what he was doing would provide us with our salvation. Remember, joy is internal and eternal. Happiness is fleeting. It's short-lived. It's external. So friends, joy is internal and it's eternal. So if you get nothing out of what I just said today, just remember, joy is internal and it's eternal. What joy in knowing we are God's children, that we are never alone, and with faith in Him can be guided, comforted, and blessed by the Creator, and that He has a place for us in heaven. Everlasting life with God Himself. That's something to be joyous about. So for the next 10 days, let's be joyous in celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well done, Gary. Thank you. So let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being in our hearts, Lord. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for taking that trip up to Calvary, Lord. And we're so sorry for the pain that you endured for us. But Jesus, we're so happy to hear that you had joy in your heart that was given to you from God the Father so that we would have salvation by accepting you as Lord, our Lord and Savior. Dear God, please be with us this week. Be with us for the next 10 days, Lord, as we celebrate in your birth, Lord. Be with us, guide us, protect us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And Father, we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.